Hello and welcome. This week we're going to finish talking about second and higher order linear ordinary differential equations. 3.8 will be a recap of some of the ideas from last week. Section 3.9 we're going to look at a second method to find a particular solution. And then in the final section we're going to extend our, our ideas to higher order linear differential equations. Let's suppose we wanted to solve an initial value problem like this. We have a non-homogeneous linear differential equation of second order with constant coefficients. And because it's a second order equation, we have two initial conditions. The method to solve a problem like this is as follows. First, we want to find the general solution to the homogeneous differential equation corresponding to our equation. In other words, we're going to take our differential equation and we're going to replace the function g by zero. Step two, we're going to want to find a particular solution to our differential equation. If the function g does not solve the homogeneous equation, then our ansatz, our mathematical guess, should look like g. G involves an exponential function, we expect our ansatz to include an exponential function. If G includes a polynomial, then we expect our ansatz to include a polynomial, and so on. There's one um, extra thing to think about. If GT does solve the homogeneous equation, then we can't have a function that looks like G. Instead, we need to take a function which looks like G and then multiply it by T. If it still doesn't work, if it still solves um, the, the homogeneous equation, then we multiply by t again, and so on. Step three, we're going to take these two functions that we found and we're going to add them together. And then finally in step four, we're going to find our constants c1 and c2 to satisfy the initial conditions. Uh, it's important that we do step four last. If we try to find the constant c1 and c2 too early, in our calculation, then we might get the wrong answer. I'm going to show you that using this relatively simple example. Solve y double prime minus y is equal to 2 e to the power t with the initial conditions y of 0 is 1, y prime of 0 is equal to 2. First, I'm going to give you the correct solution to this problem. We're going to do step 1 first, then step 2, then step 3, then step 4. So first, we need to solve the homogeneous equation corresponding to our differential equation. This is quite a simple equation. y double prime minus y equal to 0 gives us the characteristic equation r squared minus 1 is equal to 0. And then we see that the roots are 1 and minus 1. As soon as we know this, we can write down the general solution to the homogeneous equation c1 e to the power t plus c2 e to the power minus t. Step two, we need to find a particular solution. Now here, because a e to the power t solves the homogeneous equation, we can't use this function in our ansatz. So instead, what we do is we multiply by t. Instead of trying a e to the power t, we're going to try a t e to the power t. We differentiate two times and we put into our equation and we can find that 2 e to the power t must be the same as 2 a e to the power t. So clearly a is equal to 1 and our particular solution must be t e to the power t. Step three, we add our two functions together. We take the solution to the homogeneous equation and we add it together with our particular solution to the non-homogeneous equation. So that's c1 e to the power t plus c2 e to the power minus t and then plus the, our particular solution plus t e to the power t. This is the general solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation. 
And then finally, step four, we need to find the constants. I'm going to skip through this. You can check that we need to have C1 is equal to 1 and C2 is equal to 0 to satisfy the initial conditions. So the correct answer to this question should be e to the power of t plus t e to the power of t. And I'm going to put this at the top. Now I'm going to try to solve the problem again, but I'm going to do the method wrong. So I'm going to get the wrong answer. First, I'm going to do step one. This is just a copy and paste from the previous slide. I'm going to get C1 e to the power t plus C2 e to the power minus t, just as before. But because I'm doing this wrong, I'm going to do step four now. I'm going to try to find constant C1 and C2 such that we satisfy the initial conditions. And I'm going to leave it for you to check that we get 3 over 2 and minus a half. So, so far we've got 3 over 2 e to the power t minus 1 over 2 e to the power t. And then let's suppose after we do step four, we do step two. Again, this slide's a copy and paste from the previous one. So just as before, we get t e to the power of t. And then to finish with step three, finally, we're going to add our solutions together. 3 over 2 e to the power of t minus 1 over 2 e to the power of minus t plus t e to the power of t. I did step one, then step four, then step two, and then step three. And I found this answer. But this, of course, is wrong. You know the correct answer because I've written it at the top. Why is it wrong? Because after we add on the plus t e to the power of t, it no longer satisfies the initial conditions. To repeat myself, we can't find the constant c1 and c2 until right at the end of our calculation. First, we need the general solution to the non-homogeneous equation, and then the fourth and final step is to find the constant C1 and C2. Another example, solve this initial value problem. And this is actually a question that I asked in an exam all the way back in 2013. Actually, in a different course, that was the course MAT 371. Students in 2013 had about 30 minutes to answer this question. Really, it was a two hour exam and they were asked to solve four questions. So two hours divided by four. I'd expect them to be able to solve this within 30 minutes. First, I want to solve the homogeneous equation. Solve the differential equation, but with zero here. Write down the characteristic equation and find the roots. I'll leave it for you to check that these are 3 plus or minus i root 7. As soon as we know the roots, we know the general solution to the, non, to the homogeneous equation is c1 e to the power of 3t sine root 7t plus c2 e to the power of 3t cos root 7t. Next, I'm breaking this up into smaller equations. I want to consider minus y double prime plus 6y prime minus 16y, but now equal to 1. That's not the whole of g, it's just part of g. And because 1 is just a constant, I'm going to try the ansatz y of t is equal to a constant. And when we go through the calculation, a simple calculation, we find that the constant must be minus 1 over 16. So the particular solution to this differential equation is 
y t is equal to minus 1 over 16. The next small problem I'm going to look at is the differential equation now with the function equal to 6 e to the power 3t sine 2t. We need an ansatz which looks like this function. This function gt doesn't solve the homogeneous equation, so we can use constant e to the power 3t sine 2t in our ansatz, and any time we have sine, we must also have cos. So the ansatz I'm going to look at is a constant e to the power 3t cos 2t plus a constant e to the power 3t sine 2t. Here's the calculation. I'm going to skip over this. You can check this at a later time if you wish. You can check that we must have a equal to 0 and b equal to minus 2. So a particular solution to this differential equation is minus 2 e to the power 3t sine 2t. So far, we've got three functions. What we're going to do is we're going to add them together. This green function is the solution to the homogeneous equation. Then we had two particular solutions, our orange function and our blue function. Adding all of these together to find the general solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation. And then we're almost finished the problem. All that's left is to do the final step. We need to choose the constants C1 and C2 such that we satisfy the initial conditions. And the calculation looks like this. Again, I don't want to dwell on the details, so I'll leave this for you to check at a later time. You can check that the constants that we want must be C1 is 0 and C2 is equal to 1. So we have our solution. The solution to the initial value problem, the answer to this problem, is e to the power 3t cos square root of 7t minus 1 over 16 minus 2 e to the power 3t side 2t. And as I said, students in the previous course were expected to, to find this solution within 30 minutes. We've been using the method of undetermined coefficients to find a particular solution. This method works well if our function gt is a nice function. What's a nice function? There's a typo here, this should be e to the power kt. e to the power kt, sine kt, a polynomial, a, an exponential multiplied by, let's say, cosh, etc. These are all nice functions. And they're nice functions because when we differentiate them, we get roughly the same type of function. However, if we don't have a nice function, if we have a function where when we differentiate it, it becomes something very different, then we're going to need a different method to find a particular solution. And that leads into our next section. The method of variation of parameters is another method to find a particular solution. For example, Find a particular solution to y double prime plus 4y is equal to 3 cosec t. For this problem, we can't use the method of undetermined coefficients because when we differentiate cosec, we don't get cosec. So we need a new method. And the idea goes like this. The homogeneous equation, y double prime plus 4y, has general solution c1 cos 2t plus c2 sine 2t. The idea is, 
Perhaps we can replace these constants c1 and c2 by some sort of special functions u1 and u2. And then we're going to have a particular solution which looks like u1 cos 2t plus u2 sine 2t. We're going to try to find the functions u1 and u2 so that capital Y solves 2. Now there's a key idea here. We don't need to find every single function which works. We only need to find one particular solution. And there's going to be many, many particular solutions that we could choose. In fact, there's going to be infinitely many particular solutions. And we only need to find one particular solution. To say this another way, there's going to be many, many, in fact, infinitely many correct choices of u1 and u2. We only need to find one correct choice of u1 and u2. That means that whenever we want, we can add in an extra condition to make our calculation easier. So let's suppose we make the guess, capital Y is U1 cos 2t plus U2 sine 2t. And let's suppose we differentiate it. We get Y prime is U1 prime cos 2t minus, U, minus 2 U1 sine 2t plus U2 prime sine 2t plus 2 U2 cos 2t. Now at this point it's getting complicated. We have four terms already. When we differentiate, we're going to have lots of terms. On the previous slide, I said we could add in an extra, extra condition whenever we want. I'm going to use our chance now. Before things get too complicated, I'm going to add in an extra condition. And the extra condition is I'm going to add in the condition u1 prime cos 2t plus u2 prime sine 2t is equal to 0. Then these red terms are going to cancel out and y prime will have only two terms in. So then when we differentiate again, y double prime will have only four terms in. And that will be manageable. So we have y prime has just the two terms in. And when we differentiate again, we get to get y double prime. We have this function with four terms in. And then we're going to substitute them into the differential equation. Y double prime, if we go back and check at a later date, that's this function, plus 4y, plus 4u1 cos 2t, plus u2 sine 2t. And a lot of these terms will cancel. Minus 4u1 plus 4u1 cos 2t, yeah. And we'll also cancel out minus 4u2 sine 2t with plus 4u2 sine 2t. And then we're just left with minus 2u1 prime sine 2t plus 2u2 prime cos 2t. And this must be the same as 3 cosec t. So let's recap. We need to find u1 and u2, which satisfies two conditions. There's this green line, which we've just found from the equation. And there's this red line, which was this extra condition that I, we added in so that the green line didn't get too complicated. These are, this is a linear system of two two equations for u1 prime and u2 prime. You know how to solve this from linear algebra. From the second line, we need to have u2 prime is minus u1 prime cos 2t divided by sine 2t. Substitute this into the first equation. Here it is. 3 cosec t, this must be minus 2u1 prime sine 2t plus 2. 
minus u1 prime cos 2t sine 2t multiplied by cos 2t. We need to simplify this, multiply everything by sine 2t, and then divide by minus 2 to get u1 prime is minus 3 cos t. As soon as we know u1 prime, we also know that u2 prime must be 3 over 2 cosec t minus 3 sine t. Just to recap, we need to find u1 prime and u2 prime, which solves this linear system. And this is the solution. This is how we solve this linear system. As soon as we know u1 prime and u2 prime, we can integrate them to find u1 and u2. The integral of cos is sine. The integral of cosec t is the natural logarithm of the absolute value of cosec t minus cotan t. And then integral of um, minus sine is cos. And that's what we need to do. Then we can write down the answer. Now we know u1 and u2. We can write down capital Y is U1 cos 2T plus U2 sine 2T. Substitute in U1 and U2, simplify a little bit, and we get the answer to this problem. Let me recap or summarize the method, and then we'll do another example. Suppose we know that C1Y1 plus C2Y2 is the general solution to a homogeneous linear differential equation. And let's suppose we want to find a particular solution to a non-homogeneous equation. We make a guess. We guess that the particular solution is U1Y1 plus U2Y2. And we make an extra condition. And the extra condition that we always make is that u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2 is equal to 0. We're going to put capital Y into our differential equation. And we're going to find equations for u1 and u2. Solve the equations to find u1 prime and u2 prime. Integrate to get u1 and u2. And then we know our particular solution. Let me repeat myself. We always guess that our particular solution is u1 y1 plus u2 y2. We always make the extra condition that u1 prime y1 plus u2 prime y2 is 0. And we use the differential equation to get our second equation for u1 prime and u2 prime. Find u1 prime and u2 prime, integrate them to u1 and u2, and then we know capital Y. Let's do another example. Find a particular solution to y double prime minus 2y prime plus y is equal to e to the power t natural logarithm of t. Again, we have a function which is not nice. e to the power t is a nice function. If we differentiate e to the power t, we see we have e to the power t. But the natural logarithm is not a nice function because when we differentiate the natural logarithm, we don't get something which looks like the natural logarithm. Instead, we get 1 over t. So we can't use the method of undetermined coefficients. We need to use the method of variation of parameters. First, we need the general solution to the homogeneous equation. So we do what we always do. We start with the characteristic equation and we find the roots. 
as soon as we know the roots, we know the, the general solution to the homogeneous equation. For the method of, un, of variation of parameters, we're going to replace C1 by a function U1, and we're going to replace C2 by a function U2. We're going to use the ansatz. Capital Y is U1 e to the power of T plus U2 T e to the power of T. We need an extra condition. As I've said before, the extra condition is always U1 prime Y1 plus U2 prime Y2 is equal to zero. For us, U1 is e to the power of T and Y2 is T e to the power of T. So we can cancel the e to the power of T's. For this example, the extra condition is that U1 prime plus U2 prime T is equal to zero. Now, what we're going to do, I've written the whole method here. We're going to differentiate two times, remembering that we have our extra condition. We're going to put them into our differential equation, and then we're going to find our second equation for u1 prime and u2 prime. Let me remind you, capital Y was u1 e to the power of t plus u2 t e to the power of t. We're going to differentiate this to get u1 prime e to the power of t plus u1 e to the power of t plus u2 prime t e to the power of t plus u2 e to the power of t plus u2 t e to the power of t. But remember we have an extra condition. We are assuming that u1 prime plus t u2 prime is equal to zero. So these first two terms are going to cancel and we're going to be left with y prime is u1 e to the power of t plus u2 e to the power of t plus u2 t e to the power of t. We're going to differentiate this again. And then we're going to use the extra condition to simplify some terms. Okay, we can cross out two terms. And we're left with y double prime is u1 e to the power of t plus u2 prime e to the power of t plus 2 u2 e to the power of t plus u2 t e to the power of t. Now we put these into our differential equation. And we're going to simplify as much as we can. What can we, what can we um, cross off? We have u1 e to the power t minus 2 u1 e to the power t plus u1 e to the power t. That's 1 minus 2 plus 1. These will all cancel. Next, plus 2u2 minus 2u2. These are going to cancel. plus u2t minus 2u2t and then plus 1u2t. Again, these are going to cancel. And we're going to be left with just one term. We're left with u2 prime e to the power of t. And then, of course, e to the power of t and e to the power of t are going to cancel. So what do we have? We, our, we have u2 prime is ln t and u1 prime from our extra condition on the previous slide must be minus u2 prime t or minus t ln t. 
We're going to integrate these to find u1 and u2. I'll leave this for you to check. Use your first year calculus to check that the integral of minus t ln t is minus a half t squared ln t plus a quarter t squared. It's integration by parts. And you will recall that the integral of ln t is t ln t minus t. And then we're almost finished. Now we know u1 and u2. All that remains is to write down the particular solution and then simplify it a little bit. Our particular solution, our ansatz, was u1 e to the power of t plus u2 t e to the power of t. Now we know u1 and u2. We substitute them in and we simplify it a little bit. And we're left with the answer to this problem. A half ln t minus three quarters multiplied by t squared e to the power of t. Great, that, that's the method which works, but isn't there an easier way to solve this problem? And the answer is yes. We have a, a theorem which we could use instead for the method of variation of parameters. What do we need? We need a fundamental set of solutions to the homogeneous equation. Then we have a formula for a particular solution to a non-homogeneous equation. And the formula is the particular solution is minus y1 integral of y2g divided by w plus y2 integral of y1g divided by w, where w is the Ronskian of y1 and y2. You will recall that as long as y1 and y2 are linearly independent, which they must be if they form a fundamental set of solutions, then the Ronskin is non-zero, at least somewhere. So it's okay to divide by W. For example, find a particular solution to Y double prime minus two Y prime plus Y is equal to E to the power T ln T. This is exactly the same ex example which we just did. Now we're going to solve it using the formula. First, we need a fundamental set of solutions to the homogeneous equation. We know how to do this. We start with the characteristic equation. We find the roots, and then we find that the functions that we want are e to the power t and t e to the power t. We also need the Ronskian of these two functions. The run screen is the determinant of the two by two matrix y1, y2, y1 prime, y2 prime. Put in e to the power t, t, e to the power t, e, derivative of e to the power t is e to the power t, derivative of t, e to the power t is e to the power t plus t, e to the power t. For the determinant, we multiply e to the power t by e to the power t plus t e to the power t first, and then we subtract the product of t e to the power t and e to the power t. And we're left with e to the power 2t. So to recap, We have the two functions y1 is e to the power t, and y2 is t e to the power t. Our function g is e to the power t ln t, and our Ronskian is e to the power 2t. Now we have everything that we need to put into the formula.
substitute these in, and a lot of these terms are going to cancel. e to the power e to the power t will cancel with e to the power 2t, and again, e to the power t, e to the power t will cancel with e to the power 2t. So we're left with minus e to the power t, intro of t ln t, plus t e to the power t, intro of ln t. After we've integrated these two functions and then simplified, we get exactly the same answer as before. Why do we get exactly the same answer? Because we're really doing exactly the same calculation. The first time we did this, we had to integrate t ln t and we had to integrate ln t. Again, we're doing the same calculation, we integrate. All the theorem really solves us is how is the, doing the extra condition, substitute into the equation, finding the second equation, and then solving the two equations. A formula saves us that work, but we still have to do exactly the same integrals that we would have done using the first method. You can use whichever method you choose to, to solve. Um, problems in an exam. Question from the chat, is the order matter for y1 and y2? So I'm guessing you're asking about this um, formula. And the answer, it doesn't, because if you swap positions of y1 and y2, then the run screen is going to get a minus sign in. Let's suppose we swapped y1 and y2, then what we're going to do is we're going to add a minus sign in w. We'll get minus minus is plus, and here we will get another minus. So you'd end up with exactly the same formula. So to answer the question, no, it doesn't matter if which function you use for y1 and which function you use for y2. Our final section for today is about higher order linear ordinary differential equations. We've developed some ideas for second order linear differential equations, we can use these same ideas to solve higher order linear equations. For example, solve four derivatives of y plus y triple prime minus seven y double prime minus y prime plus six y is equal to zero with the initial conditions y zero is one, y prime is zero is zero, y double prime is zero is minus two, y triple prime is zero is minus one. We have a fourth order differential equation. When we have a fourth order differential equation, we need to have four initial conditions. The number of initial conditions we have is always the same as the order of the differential equation. How do we solve a problem like this? First, we write down the characteristic equation. The numbers here are 1, 1, minus 7, minus 1, and 6. So the numbers in our characteristic equation are 1, 1, minus 7, minus 1, and plus 6. Exactly the same ideas that we've developed before. We find the roots of our characteristic equation. A little bit more difficult than finding the roots of a, sec of a second degree poly polynomial, but it's still possible. The roots of this polynomial are 1, minus 1, 2, and minus 3. After we found the roots, we can write down the general solution to the differential equation.
from the first root, R1 is equal to 1, we get the function e to the power of t. From the second root, minus 1, we get e to the power of minus t. From the root 2, we get e to the power of 2t. And from the root minus 3, we get the function e to the power of minus 3t. And again, the number 4 is appearing. Fourth order equation, four initial conditions, four constants, c1, c2, c3, and c4. To finish the property, to finish our answer, we need to find the constant c1, c2, c3, and c4, which satisfy the initial conditions. We have a linear system of four equations. Solving these, we can find our constants c1, c2, c3, and c4. And then we can write down the solution to the initial value problem. Exactly the same ideas that we've developed, but now for a fourth order equation. Another problem. Solve four derivatives of y minus y is equal to e to the power of t. First, I want a general solution to the homogeneous equation. So I'm going to start with the characteristic equation. R to the power of 4 minus 1 is equal to 0. We can find the, that the roots are 1, minus 1, i, and minus i. And then we can write down the general solution to the homogeneous equation. From 1 and minus 1, we get e to the power of t and e to the power of minus t. From i and minus i, we get cos t and sine t. Next, we're going to want to find a particular solution to the differential equation. And let me remind you, our function gt is e to the power of t. But we're already using e to the power of t in our solutions of homogeneous equation. So we can't use e to the power of t again in our ansatz. Instead, we're going to have to multiply by t, and we're going to try the ansatz a t e to the power of t. Differentiate four times. I'll leave this for you to check, and then substitute into the differential equation. We find that e to the power of t must be the same as 4a e to the power of t. So a must be a quarter. So a quarter t e to the power of t is a particular solution to the differential equation. This is the method of undetermined coefficients. This still works for fourth order equations. Add them together and we have our general solution to the non-homogeneous differential equation. C1 e to the power of t plus C2 e to the power of minus t plus C3 cos t plus C4 sine t plus a quarter t e to the power of t. What do we do if a characteristic equation has repeated roots? We just multiply by t. So for example, let's suppose we had a sixth order equation, and let's suppose that the roots are 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, and 8. Then the general solution looks like this. e to the power of 7t. The second root we multiply by t and we get t e to the power of 70. For the third function, again, we multiply by t. Now we have t squared e to the power of 70. We need a fourth function. We multiply by t and we get t cubed e to the power of 70. 
for the fifth function, again, we multiply by t, t to the power 4, e to the power 70. For the sixth function, the root is different, so we go back to e to the power 8t. For the final example of today, we get an example of going backwards. You will find questions like this in the lecture notes we practice with. Let's suppose we're told a solution and we're asked to find a differential equation which has this solution. Find a linear, homogeneous differential equation with constant coefficients which has the general solution, c1 e to the power of t plus c2 t e to the power of t plus c3 e to the power of 2 t sine t plus c4 e to the power of 2 t cos t plus c5 e to the power of 2 t t sine t plus c6 e to the power of 2 t t cos t cos t. Let's look at this solution and try to find what are the roots of the characteristic equation. First, we have e to the power of t, so the first root must be 1. The second function is t e to the power of t, so the second root must also be 1. Then we have e to the power of t sine t and e to the power of 2t cos t. We're going to do these together. The third and fourth roots must be 2 plus i and 2 minus i. And then the final two functions I'm going to look at again, together again. To write down R5 and R6. We have e to the power 2t t, t sine t and e to the power 2t t, t cos t. These are the same type of functions as we had before but multiplied by t. We're going to have the same roots repeated. We must have 2 plus i and 2 minus i. So to recap, the first two terms have the repeated root 1, and then the last four terms correspond to repeated complex root 2 plus or minus i. We can, now that we know the roots, we can find the characteristic equation. So r is equal to 1, the characteristic equation must have r minus 1 squared in. From 2, from 2 plus i, and we have two of these, a characteristic equation must have r minus 2 plus i, or r minus 2 minus i, because it's repeated, it's squared. And from 2 minus i, our characteristic equation must include r minus 2 minus i, or r minus 2 plus i. And because we have the, because the root is repeated, this must, term must be squared. What we do is we multiply this all out, and we end up with the characteristic equation r to the power of 6 minus 10 r to the power of 5 plus 43 r to the power of 4 minus 100 r cubed plus 131 r squared minus 90 r plus 25, which I leave for you to check. As soon as we know a characteristic equation, we can write down a differential equation because the numbers must be the same. From 1 r 6, 
we know that we must have one d6y dt6 from minus 10 r5. We know that our differential equation must include minus 10 d5y dt5 and so on. Plus 43 r to the power 4, we change to plus 43 d4y dt4. Minus 100 r cubed becomes minus 100 d cubed y dt cubed. Plus 131 r squared becomes plus 131 d squared y dt squared. Minus 90r becomes minus 90 dy dt, and plus 25 becomes plus 25y is equal to 0. A question like this has infinitely many correct answers because we are just after finding a equation which has this solution. And that is the end of today's lesson. That is the end of chapter three. Next week, we're going to start chapter four. We're going to start talking about the Laplace transformer. If you look in the content, the course content section, you'll see an item called elementary Laplace transforms. I suggest that you print this out or have this on a second screen with you for next week's lesson. Are there any questions? This year, the midterm exam is going to be a multiple choice question because the university doesn't want to pay for um, ex exams to be marked. So it'll just be a multiple choice question which the system will mark for you. 